Hi, all. Thank you for joining our webinar. I'm Luz Zambrano, the Recon 2019 Director in the lead up of, to the most important Renewable Energy Congress in Central America and the Caribbean. The Recon is delighted to host this free webinar. A execution of successful renewable energy projects in Central America and the Caribbean. This year, RECAN will bring more than 300 professionals from the entire chain value of the renewable energy actively working in the region, all under one roof in Panama City. Two days from the 12th to the 13th of March, packed with content and networking opportunities. If you do register by Wednesday, the 19th of December, using code webinar10, you will have a discount of 10%. Uh, I'm going to introduce you with uh, uh, our moderator, uh, Miguel Silva. He is the general manager of 8760 Consulting. Uh, Mr. Silva has worked in the solar PV industry since 1993. He has 18 years in engineer procurement and construction in Venezuela, USA, Canada, Spain, and eight years in project development engineering in Chile, Brazil, Panama, Honduras, and Argentina. Mr. Silva works as an independent technical advisor for multi-billion dollar energy corporations. He's an enthusiastic of the science of where just Geospatial Information System, a co-founder of GeoFuture, a startup technology company developing an optimization software that helps owners to identify the best single access tracker for the project. Mr. Silva's solar PV knowledge, plus his early days working in rural development, plays him as a unique position to face challenges related to large PV projects. If you have any question, please type them on your question box. And now I'm going to hand it to uh, Mr. Silva, who is going to introduce the panelists. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Luz, uh, very much for, thank you very much for the introduction and to Green Power Global for the opportunity. I think that events like this are, are very useful for, for everybody to, to get a better understanding of the opportunities that uh, are out there in the market. Uh, when we look at the, the midterm 2018 GTM research report, uh, it indicates that there is about one gigawatt of PB capacity installed and operational in Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, this is very encouraging. And uh, so, so we, what we will do today is during this conversation, we will try to address different questions uh, with our uh, panelists that will allow us to, to have a better perspective uh, about how to, to face uh, the challenges of developing projects in the region. Some of the topics that uh, we will discuss are uh, related to what considerations need to be taken into account before carrying out projects in the region, uh, how to go about project planning and looking at how regulations, financing or weather conditions in the region may impact uh, project outcomes. What are some of the best practices and strategies for the execution of of projects and at the end uh, uh, we will try to get some uh, lessons learned from uh, from the region uh, without uh, taking more time I would like to allow Robert and Jade to introduce themselves and I would like to uh, ask them to tell us a, a little bit about them uh, how long have they been involved in the in the renewable energy industry uh, what is their expertise? Uh, what do you think uh, uh, you, you, is the area where you add the most value? And what are your expectations for from this event today? So 
thanks again for the opportunity. And uh, Robert, would you please uh, go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Miguel. Uh, I, I love to do that. Um, and also thanks, Luz, uh, for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, participate in this webinar. Uh, just before I start off, uh, I already look forward to, um, uh, to, to the next RECAM event. Uh, I've been visiting RECAM for, uh, for, for three or four years or so, and uh, I agree it's, uh, it's really a successful renewable energy event in, uh, in the Central American and the Caribbean region. Uh, bringing together uh, all the players, both from developing, sponsor, and financing, but also technical expertise and advisory side. So, in 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 a few year words, just the um, yeah, uh, an ideal uh, uh, platform to uh, to uh, engage in in business and and do business development. Um, so, Robert Voskuyle, I represent uh, FMO. Um, I, uh, I represent the energy side uh, for FMO in, uh, in Latin America. Uh, FMO itself, uh, for the ones that don't know us that well, we are the Dutch Development Bank. Uh, we operate in the private sector and energy, and in particular, uh, uh, renewable energy is, is one of our focus areas. Uh, we have a, a total committed portfolio of roughly 10 billion euros. Uh, of which uh, uh, some one fourth, so 2.5 billion, is um, is invested and committed to uh, to energy, and uh, within that probably uh, 80 80 percent uh, uh, renewables, and especially in Latin America where our portfolio is uh, is roughly uh, it's between it's around 550 560 million, uh, uh, it's all invested in uh, in renewables. Uh, we are technology agnostic, uh, so we engage in, um, in of course, in uh, in solar, PV solar, uh, but also wind energy, uh, hydro, geothermal, uh, and even a little bit of biomass. Um, looking back, I think in the last uh, sort of uh, uh, decade, uh, especially solar and wind have been the fast growing uh, technologies in our portfolio. Um, in terms of uh, what we uh, what e we and I have been doing in the industry, uh, we actually were part of the um, of the financing for the first uh, utility scale uh, PV solar project in the whole of Latin America, um, um, outside of Brazil um, uh, and, and Mexico, which which happened in Peru, and that was back in uh, back in 2000, uh, 2010 more or less. Uh, but in the meantime, we have uh, unloaded uh, loads of other uh, projects in um, in Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, some of the fast uh, growing uh, growing countries in our portfolio, in terms of solar, uh, have been uh, uh, Honduras recently, uh, but also uh, Dominican Republic, and uh, and maybe a bit more recently uh, uh, El Salvador. Um, the um, uh, the, the 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 added value that uh, that FMO brings to projects is really uh, provide long term financing in markets in uh, in countries uh, in regions where it is not let's say readily available. Uh, there's a, there's an increasing pressure, I would say, on uh, on the financing on the financing terms, including the tenors, um, <clears throat> to keep let's say to keep up. Uh, with the uh, with the downward spiral that we see tariffs going, especially with the element of um, uh, of of let's say incentive programs, but m even more auctions coming into play where there's competitive bidding, uh, we we generally see tariffs coming down, uh, and 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 that's where we can uh, probably add value because we are able to provide long-term financing and to expose our balance sheet. Um, so we have a we also have a large network of uh, of other development finance institutions, but also commercial banks that we can bring along in uh, in the transactions that we that we finance. Um, yeah, again, my expectations of the event is uh, to uh, to to reconnect with uh, with all that we already know and uh, and to also learn uh, new new people uh, that engage in the renewable energy uh, industry. Uh, in Central America and the Caribbean. Thank you. Uh, back to you, uh, Miguel. 
Very interesting. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. Uh, I, I, so I, I think your your experience uh, is is very valuable, and I, I will be interested to to learn more uh, about what are some of the challenges you you have uh, faced uh, along our conversation. So, Jade, uh, would you please go ahead and introduce yourself for the audience? Yeah, you may be on mute. Would you please? Uh... Sorry about that. Um, I just, uh, thank you, Miguel. Um, I'd also like to thank Luz for giving me the opportunity to be on this call, on this webinar, sorry. Um, I've been to, I was, I, I went to my first recall event last year and I felt, and it was, it was very well organized, a, a good opportunity to do business. Um, being from the Eastern Caribbean, from St. Lucia, uh, they were, it showed that there's a stark difference between Latin American projects and what we face in the Eastern Caribbean, although our energy bills are quite high. I am the managing director at NOAA Energy. Again, like I said, based in St. Lucia, but we work across a few islands. Um, so just to let you know that renewable energy is relatively new in the Eastern Caribbean, and therefore there's not, the regulations are still being a challenge, but what we do is, we. In 2014, when we started, we realized that the challenge and try, and try to create partnerships with larger companies who can provide a lot of the engineering support that we need since the capacity locally had not been is in development and there is and is slowly being developed. So we partner with larger companies to deliver solar and solar and renewables, energy efficiency projects, and looking into building automation in because the in in the in the small islands we have to take a combined approach in helping the, our clients reduce the energy the energy bills over the last few years we've done projects for the government of St. Lucia both and currently managing a couple of projects out in the in Grenada um, so yeah so this is a bit about my company again we started in 2014 so we're a relatively young company and this is it. And thanks, Miguel. Uh, thank you, Jade. So I, I think that uh, islands uh, represent a, a very interesting uh, opportunity because of the of the very high uh, electricity rates, but also uh, quite a challenge due to the the fact that the, the systems are you know island systems, and so grid integration and and penetration of variable generation. Uh, could become a challenge, uh, plus also some um, aspects or challenges related to to the weather. So, so I, I look forward to to learn more uh, about some of those challenges as we go along. So, so uh, in order to to get started, uh, I, I would like to 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 learn a little bit more and, and try to set up a, a framework about what should be uh, some of the considerations to be taken into account before carrying a, out uh, projects in the region. Uh, what, what I have noticed along my experience in emerging markets is that uh, there is always a, a combination that is good, but it could be dangerous as well. And that is, uh, there is a lot of bullishness uh, from the developer side uh, with respect to, to being first to market, and to, to being able to win and, and be aggressive with pricing. And in the other side, uh, utilities and regulators don't, don't quite uh, sometimes understand, well, uh, you know, what, what does it mean to, to incorporate variable generation into the grid? So technical requirements may be a little bit uh, uh, relaxed. And, and that sometimes led to some uh, uh, complexities and some uh, on the side of uh, results. So from from the, when, when FMO, Robert, uh, looks into a, a new market, into a new country, uh, what what is the, you know, what, what is what you look for, uh, uh, the, for projects to be carried out? And, and first of all, what, what is your strategy to approach these markets uh, in Central America or the Caribbean where where uh, PPAs may be, you know, done on, on local currency or, or there may not be any uh, previous experience. W would you please elaborate about FMO's uh, involvement and strategy in, the, in Central America and the Caribbean? And then uh, 
tell us about what, what do you look after uh, for carrying out a, a project? Sure, sure. Thanks, uh, Miguel. Um, yeah, FMO has been active in uh, in Central America and and the Caribbean uh, to some extent for quite some quite some time. Uh, so for for over twenty years, uh, also in the energy business. And of course, twenty years ago, it was uh, it was a fossil fuel based low power, but it has shifted uh, uh, more towards renewables, of course. Um, so what we what we look for is, uh, of course, the PPA needs to be bankable. And uh, luckily, in in Central America, most economies are uh, are fairly dollarized. And uh, actually, um, uh, the PPAs that that I know in um, in in Central America, at least, they are all uh, basically also dollarized. So there, the currency uh, uh, risk is, of course, still there, but it is a little bit more remote. Um, the uh, uh, one of the elements that 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 come into play with uh, let's say large enthusiastic and 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 uh, 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 large plans to shift towards renewables for countries is that uh, most of the renewable action of course is centered in uh, in certain areas where well if we talk about PV solar where the irradiation is uh, is is good and where uh, there is also uh, uh, good connectivity. Uh, to the grid, uh, but especially the irradiation part is um, is something which, in in most cases, is the first thing that that uh, that the developer would look at. Uh, so I think you hinted already at, uh, at at technical aspects. So that can come into play when certain areas are become too overloaded, of course, with uh, with intermittent power. That, uh, that 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 you can have issues, maybe not structural issues. Uh, but that you can have uh, sort of ramp up issues with uh, with these projects uh, becoming fully utilized online. Um, that's that's one thing for us. The um, the framework, uh, the regulatory framework uh, in which also PPAs are are embedded, is another important thing. Uh, in uh, in many countries, there are certain uh, in incentive schemes, sometimes even uh, uh, partial uh, government guarantees. That are being provided, and those can all help in uh, in getting uh, the, the financiers at least um, uh, also fully comfortable. Uh, one observation that uh, that we have is that in, in in many cases actually we see that uh, on on the equity side, on the developing side, uh, parties tend to be uh, somewhat more bullish than than on the debt side, which is which is fair because you play a different role. Uh, but uh, in in the end, of course, the idea is that that should not Sort of hinder uh, hinder the, the projects to be to be developed. Um, the, uh, the the track record and reputation of the uh, of the off taker uh, payment track record that's of course a very important one. Uh, and there, uh, especially in uh, in Central America, of course, that's uh, there's there's quite a bit of dynamics, and uh, there are certain uh, countries even as we speak. Uh, that are facing um, uh, certain challenges with respect to uh, off-taker payment, uh, payment behavior and payment capacity. And that also uh, relates to a large extent to in to what extent off-takers are uh, allowed to take measures uh, against uh, all kinds of technical losses, uh, are allowed to, uh, to, and commercializers are allowed to, uh, to, to raise prices and to what extent are end user tariffs or the prices, the end user tariffs, reflective of um, of the cost of of generation? Uh, um, in in a system where the end user tariff is uh, is set in a sustainable way and which is fully reflective of uh, of of of, uh, of the generation cost, there there is no reliance on uh, on subsidies, uh, and that in our view makes makes up uh, a healthy. A healthy system, a healthy sector to uh, uh, to uh, to enter into uh, as one of the key uh, parameters. That is, of course, the, the drilling down to the project level itself. Uh, we we will uh, do the, um, uh, the the due diligence that is probably known uh, by by most of the participants in this webinar. Uh, but we will obviously uh, not only look at the uh, at, at off taker at country at the regulatory framework. But we also look, of course, at technical issues. Uh, of course, at the resource 
very important. Um, we'll look at the uh, local legal framework in terms of uh, whether we can uh, get the, uh, uh, the, the interest of the lenders also secured to an extent that we, uh, that we are comfortable and last but not least, um, the sponsor strength and the sponsor track record. I think in, in especially in Central America and, uh, and, and, and Caribbean, um, uh, in any case the larger islands, uh, there's a fair bit of activity of, of large reputable uh, developers and sponsors that, that are uh, very deliberately uh, uh, focusing on, on the Central American market. And we, uh, we, we work and have worked with, uh, with a lot of them and uh, that provides uh, for, for uh, quite some comfort. Uh, also, they, they, they uh, in the end, have a diversified portfolio uh, spread over different countries, um, it, moving from the mainland to the, uh, to, uh, to the islands. Uh, we, uh, we are quite active in the larger ones, uh, especially Dominican Republic, uh, where we have um, financed um, uh, three or four projects, uh, uh, mostly, uh, mostly PV solar, uh, but also in Jamaica, we're, we are active uh, in uh, in hydropower and also still uh, sort of some uh, all the projects that are in um, in, in fossil fuel um, uh, fired power plants um, in the smaller countries we we also look into but we we, we see that it's a bit more difficult especially for um, uh, for a financier like us uh, there are the, the smaller sort of grid systems they will face more issues with um, with intermittent power so that leads on the one hand to to much smaller projects uh, that sometimes um, uh, unfortunately are too small uh, for us to, uh, to pick up on. Uh, and that's one of the side effects that we've seen across the board with the, with the, uh, uh, with the coming down fastly of, the, uh, of the, uh, the, the, the EPC prices basically for, um, uh, for solar projects, for PV solar projects, is that projects become less expensive. and. Um, we always uh, many banks had sort of a critical mass minimum uh, for projects to be interest to be interesting uh, because that that relates to the ticket sizes that uh, that that these banks uh, uh, want to go after. Um, so that also in our case is uh, is sometimes a bit difficult. Uh, although we do have a fair bit of flexibility, I would say uh, to also do some some um, uh, some smaller tickets. But then it really needs to be replicable. Uh, maybe with with the same developer towards other uh, smaller islands, and one other topic that we are increasingly looking into also for the smaller islands is um, uh, is, uh, is is storage, uh, because that would be one solution, of course, uh, to overcome, um, let's say, uh, uh, stability issues in um, in in um, in smaller uh, in smaller islands, but also in um, in regions in countries where. There's a lot of um, uh, concentration and basically uh, maybe a bit of overcapacity in, t in terms of uh, intermittent um, intermittent power or energy like um, uh, like solar. Um, back to you, Miguel. Yes, uh, perfect. So, so yeah, energy storage is uh, is an interesting, uh, of course, uh, um, route that we want to look at, uh, especially for islands, which uh, could help to to provide a number of benefits and also to allow for higher penetration into the grid of viable generation. So, Jay, you, you are from St. Lucia and you, and you work in, in Ireland. So I, I will be interested in, in learning from you how, how, how do you uh, set up uh, an, an energy company in, in, in the islands and what are some, what, what is your approach and what uh, are some of the challenges that you face uh, due to uh, regulations and, 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 and also the weather. So I would like you to touch briefly on those two points and so, so we can get a, a, an idea of what you do. So, and um, yeah, as I said, from the smaller islands, one of the challenges, obviously, for, like um, Robert said, was because of the smaller islands, we do have a lot smaller projects. So being able to and, to build it, and therefore the industry hasn't developed as quickly, into, especially in terms of building capacity. So what we've done is started to create a series of partnerships with larger companies who could provide the engineering support that we needed while we act as the partners on the ground, being able 
to meet the clients and deal with a lot of the issues on the ground, including the installation and maintenance and any other issues that the clients may have. So we interact directly with the local with the locals, whether it be in St. Lucia or other, or other countries. In terms of one of the biggest challenges of smaller projects is actually getting financing. So if the banks not, a lot of banks within the smaller banks within the region aren't set up to finance solar projects. And therefore, larger banks, because of the scale, is still very difficult for us to get financing for these projects. We've been talking to a few banks in terms of how we could aggregate projects to be able to find financing for them. But that, again, is slow moving because of regulations. In the regulations vary across the region. In some islands, they do have a, a semblance of decent regulations where you allow allowed larger projects up to, say, 100 kilowatts, which is some, in, some of the, in some of the small islands, whereas in St. Lucia, for example, the regulations t still only allow 25 kilowatt projects onto the grid, up to 25 kilowatt projects for commercial, pro for commercial clients. That in itself, when clients look at these figures, the paybacks and the IRRs don't really make the solar system attractive. Even at 30, what, 34 cents per kilowatt to the utility, the clients still think that the, the paybacks are too, are take, still take too long. So these are some of the challenges we have. In terms of the weather, again, we're dead bang in the hurricane zone. In the hurricane zone. So, I mean, it's last year we probably had two hurricanes that hit well, Dominica the year before in Puerto Rico. So being able to design for that and being able to design resilience into the systems that you want. The challenges include being able to design up to 170 mile, 170 mile an hour winds. Or also now when you design for these type of winds and the infrastructure that you're trying to put these systems on sometimes isn't up to, up, up to standard. Therefore, you still then have to find out, the clients still have to find funds to where to reinforce the roofs or upgrade the electricals. So the challenges become a lot more technical in terms of the client's infrastructure. And then we have the utilities. In most of the islands, the islands, the utilities are partially government owned. So the transition into a more favorable system then the more favorable regulations then takes a lot a lot of time. We do get support from say uh, from a lot of some a lot of NGOs such as the Carbon War Room and RMI but a lot of the new a lot of the ideas that I've seen have come out that have come out tend to be a very utility focused scenario where the utility a utility model where the utility is in charge of most of the power plants or solar plants around. There's also a push into geothermal. Again that's a big utility led pro big utility led projects. So it, because of the size of the projects we uh, and the finance is not available. We do have very long lead times in just trying to develop projects within the Eastern Caribbean. I see. Yeah. Yes, uh, th thank you. And, uh, and, and definitely uh, weather uh, and uh, hurricanes are, are a big uh, challenge which uh, increase the cost. Uh, but that should somehow uh, you know, be compensated with the higher rates that are paid in in, in some of those islands. So I'm I'm curious to know, uh, uh, Robert, from your experience, uh, uh, one of the the key uh, aspects uh, that to take into account uh, when planning for these type of projects is, of course, on one side you have the the regulations and the the that will basically uh, determining how the projects uh, will connect and, and where and, and what are the re interconnection requirements plus all the environmental requirements but also you have challenges due to uh, the weather and for example I know of projects in, in uh, El Salvador where they had experienced uh, uh, unusual uh, rainy seasons more than six months which has have an impact on completion dates. So, 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 how can you please elaborate a little bit about uh, these two points? In one side, due to regulations not being uh, clearly defined, you may have situations where in one substation there is uh, there are many many projects being connected, and uh, had you faced uh, uh, any of your projects uh, 
where they have been curtailed uh, uh, by the uh, utility company and also have you have any problems where or, or challenges where uh, your projects have missed the COD or, or because of uh, unexpected weather events so what, what, what will be your your feedback on, on those two areas um, thank you, Miguel. Um, so, uh, first, maybe on curtailment. Um, I believe we are still relatively lucky that we have not faced, let's say, uh, a structural curtailment um, in our portfolio, in Latin America at least. Uh, there are certain sort of sub-regions uh, where a little bit of curtailment has, has taken place. Uh, due to indeed uh, uh, too uh, too intensive connectivity, if you will, uh, to, uh, to 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 substations or to a particular node uh, in 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 that area, and and that relates to yeah concentration of projects uh, with good irradiation uh, in the case of PV solar in 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 the south of Honduras, uh, but I mean in my view, in our view, not really on a structural way. We've seen the same thing uh, in the in the southern section of um, uh, of, uh, of Nicaragua um, uh, with uh, with all the wind farms there near um, near Lake Nicaragua, um, where also let's say the the amount of available uh, electricity in certain parts of the day. Uh, do or did pose uh, to some extent a challenge to accept it all, and, and hence uh, the, uh, the, the, the take and pay structures of the PPAs didn't fully work out. But also that um, I think uh, it certainly is not detrimental and, and is not, um, uh, not really a, a, a structural issue that, uh, that is endangering any of our projects. Um, in terms of um, unexpected weather uh, conditions, yes, we've seen that, of course, across the board. Uh, in PV solar, maybe not so much so yet, uh, because the construction is, is fairly, uh, fairly uh, uh, yeah, simple if you compare it to some other technologies. I mean, we've experienced it much more, for example, with, um, with hydropower. Uh, where uh, landslides, uh, as a result of intense rain, can really um, sort of uh, yeah shake up the uh, the timelines that that, that one has uh, for uh, for construction. But the and also the track record of, um, of of EPC parties come into play here. So especially in countries that uh, that open up to renewables for, for the first time, uh, that there's I mean usually there's a fair bit of subcontracting needed as well. Uh, and if, if an EPC party is working in, an, in, a, in a certain country or in a, in a region for the first time, uh, there, you will always find all kinds of practicalities that, uh, that can come into play and, and can basically uh, uh, interfere with the expected timelines. And that's why it's very important that, uh, that for any project, and we always check on that, of course, uh, 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 together with our LTA, and, and we, seek, uh, we seek advice there from our uh, lenders technical advisors that there's um, there's at least some um, some leeway um, at the end of uh, the uh, the anticipated uh, COD date um, to uh, to extend construction to cater for uh, or to mitigate uh, any unforeseen uh, conditions that were experienced and still make it uh, make it to um, uh, to the PPA COD date without incurring any any penalties. Okay, thank you. So, so Jade, uh, would you please elaborate about your experience uh, uh, developing projects? I, I understand that at some point you did some work with the World Bank in projects in St. Lucia in Grenada. So, can, can you please uh, uh, add to what uh, Robert just, just said? Thanks, Miguel. Just to, uh, so yeah, we did, World Bank funded three projects across St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and Grenada. Uh, the idea was to demonstrate what a commercial scale system would be like at 200 kilowatts. The first challenge obviously became with the regulations because in most of these islands, 200 kilowatts is not allowed onto the grid. 
uh, Grenada on light generation is a bit further ahead, so they do allow 100 kilowatts, and they do an impact, and they do have an impact study. Anything above 30, 30 kilowatts, they, do, you know, they take an impact study to, to verify whether or not the system is whether any upgrades need to be done to the grid for to allow the system to be interconnected. In Grenada, they have a buy all sell all arrangement, whereas in Saint Lucia, that's not actually set up as yet. So having to do these regulations have been were a bit of a challenge. But and the way the and the way the utilities approached the projects was slightly different. So in Grenada it was a 20 kilowatt project which was fine, whereas in Saint Lucia the utility wanted to take a more demonstration approach uh, and use the project as a test to see whether or not the grid as an experiment to see about test is whether or not the grid can actually handle the 20 kilowatts. In, in the tenders themselves, in terms of technically, we tried to make sure that the buildings were designed to withstand the Cat, Cat 5 hurricane. So in St. Lucia, it was up to Cat, Cat 3. So in St. Lucia, it was designed to withstand 170 mile an hour winds. We under, the As part of the tender, we respect that. Uh, so the panels would be individually racked, individually mounted to the racking. And there would be no mid clamps, but probably end clamps at each point helping to start to help helping with resilience and the panels themselves in trying to find out whether we could find panels which had an uplift uh, wind resistance of 200 miles an hour or 5400 pascals so having the panels themselves be more rigid within the region and that would help because i'm not sure if everyone knows but Grenada suffered a major hurricane in about, about 10 years ago which then again they had to start from scratch being able to design these parameters directly into the into this into the tender and therefore having and also creating additional standards for example making sure the panels with bloomberg were part of the bloomberg tier one panels um on the bloomberg tier one list a lot of a lot of the projects in lucia because clients gen in the caribbean a lot of clients tend to focus just on price Therefore, the qual and therefore that affects the quality of the systems that actually install. So, being able to set standards like the Bloomberg Tier One list, or being able to get panels or get inverters which are sealed and have a high IP rating, because in the in the, again in the region, being small islands, there's a lot of salt mist around. So, being able to deal with some of these these technical issues as part of the tender was we had we had to we had, we had to incorporate some of these technical issues as part of the tender. I see. Yeah. So, so thank you for for that. So the, the uh, along the project planning, uh, there is obviously a, a very important part, which is uh, the project development engineering, uh, which uh, takes care of all the pre-engineering studies that are necessary to to support the decisions that are being made for equipment selection and also uh, uh, EPC costs. And, 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 and that uh, basically is, is part of what the best practices are for project development. So, so one of the, the, the challenges uh, that I have seen uh, along my career is in, in Latin America is uh, for the, the difficulties that some projects have to to go across the final mile, the last mile before closing finance, due to uh, uh, a long list of conditions present, and so so from that point, uh, Robert, uh, I would like to ask, uh, based on your experience, what what have you seen are the the most recurrent condition condition precedent uh, items that, that uh, are not initially taken care of by the developers and which costs uh, project finance to, to, to delay, which also put a lot of pressure on project execution, sometimes, you know, forcing uh, as, as having to accelerate the scale, which of course will increase the cost and change the economics. So, so based on, on your experience what what are the most challenging condition precedents that you see from the uh, technical point of view or from the development point of view let's say mineral rights or or or, or title on the land 
and and that they are more challenging to to clear on time uh, during the the technical due diligence in the financial close phase. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, thank you. So uh, the most the most uh, so what what are the challenges in terms of really getting to financial close to getting to disbursements? Um, yeah, it's maybe fair to say that uh, in uh, in a lot of uh, uh, cases, uh, let's say the, the the getting and obtaining of of uh, certain securities under local legal frameworks and or licenses um, is sometimes a little bit underestimated because it's just not known, especially when when uh, a developer a sponsor operates for the first time in a country. And depending, of course, on the importance and the weight of such um, uh, such security or, or license, uh, yeah, it can it can delay uh, a first disbursement. Uh, in terms of mobilization of EPC parties, can be, but I don't see that that often, especially not with um, with uh, with very experienced uh, uh, EPC uh, parties. Uh, and in, in many cases, of course, there's a fair bit of work and groundwork already done uh, uh, if, if the sponsor has decided to, uh, to start investing and, and basically uh, injecting its, its equity portion already up front. Um, other elements, uh, especially in Central America, there's, of course, there, there can be environmental and social elements that, 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 that come into play. Uh, especially with um, with communities uh, in certain countries, um, one sort of issue uh, can be a sticky issue or become a sticky issue is the um, is the insurance packages, uh, uh, where you might also have the case that uh, certain expectations uh, uh, between lenders and, and and sponsors deviate from. What really is uh, is able to be achieved in in certain jurisdictions, so I think that um, that gives gives uh, gives you uh, some flavor for what what can come into play. But it can be everything, of course. I mean, if if there would be an adverse weather condition all of a sudden happening, uh, and especially in the Caribbean, uh, which is which is uh, a bit more unpredictable and also with quite severe uh, weather conditions. That can obviously uh, also come into play for uh, for reaching financial close. Yeah, and and uh, Jade mentioned uh, the you, you know using tier one PV models, uh, the the Bloomberg list as, as a reference, and I, I I wanted to ask you because when when you look at the tier one uh, uh, in this case the Bloomberg list. There are companies that are listed in, in, in there, which when you look at their uh, their balance sheet, they have terrible debt to to equity uh, ratios. So so the product may be good technically, but but the financially they they are not the, the best. So so uh, when an FMO has a project. Uh, uh, in front to to be evaluated and to decide finance Do, does fmo looks at the for example let's talk about the pv modes do, do you look at the pv modes that it must have uh, listed it, it has to be listed in the uh, bloomberg list or do you perform your own independent evaluation looking at the attributes in the in the in the for, for each particular manufacturer let's say there is a newcomer that doesn't have a track record but it it, it, it has you know a strong balance sheet so how, how what, what would you advise to a developer that wants to experiment with with a newcomer into the PV model industry and and and, and it has apparently to have a, a good product. So, what, what would be your recommendation? Yeah, that, that is, I mean, rather an obvious answer, probably. But uh, we, we really look for track record. So, indeed, we we look for the right certification uh, of the of the panels and and to the track record of the panel provider and to the let's say track record in terms of how uh, how that certain uh, type of panel uh, has been deployed. 
sometimes we come across uh, 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 panels that maybe are from a, an established uh, supplier, but uh, the type of panel is still fairly new. Yeah, then then we we obviously uh, 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 very much also depend on uh, the positive advice of the uh, of the independent engineer slash the uh, lender's technical advisor uh, in order to get to get comfortable. Um, in in general, in PV solar, we see a lot of uh, fully wrapped EPC structures, uh, and so everything is in one hand, and then uh, of course that one hand should also have uh, have a, a decent enough uh, balance sheet and 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 and, and track record. Uh, so that is that is indeed very important to us, and and not just the uh, uh, the the track record of the panels it, itself, but also again uh, to what extent will that particular EPC party have track record already in that particular country that, uh, that, that they are supposed to work on, on the project that we are going to finance. Exactly. Okay, so, so it's a combination of having, a, you know, a, a good PC partner with the, the can, uh, you know, execute the project and, and with the PV model having, uh, for example, a bankability report the, from uh, a reputable uh, independent engineer that, that you know talks about the company and the product so exactly and also in, in some cases uh, it, it requires uh, a little bit of going back and forth between uh, between the developer uh, in combination with lenders to the supplier for instance in, in certain in countries in uh, in in the southern Kong uh, there have been uh, a, a number of examples where uh, projects PV projects actually were are being developed uh, in at such an altitude that it was beyond, let's say, the certification and the warranty levels uh, of, uh, of of panel suppliers, uh, and and yeah, then 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 you need to zoom in on that particular aspect and and go back uh, to the supplier uh, in in order to get comfortable and and uh, and and get back to the uh, to the bankable status, if you will, of uh, of, of of the whole uh, project. Yeah, exactly, and at that high altitude, uh, not not only the PV models, but also inverters and insulation levels will will uh, will be challenged. Exactly. So, so that that's where uh, you know, uh, I think the most important phase is the the from the technical point of view is a is a project development engineering phase where where you set up the basis of design and and the and make the key decisions and validate uh, what what are the the right products to be to be used. So, so uh, Jay, can you uh, elaborate a, a little bit more? Do you have anything to add uh, with regards to uh, you know what what are the challenges to 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 reach finan financial close uh, in pro that you are facing in projects in in, uh, in the Caribbean? And what are some of the strategies uh, that you have adopted to to ensure a higher uh, uh, rate of success when when you reach at that point? Well, in terms, I mean, one of the chart in terms of closing up projects. Um, again, some of the, all the projects in the carbon is still very new, especially in Lucia. I mean, we have islands like Barbados who have probably a larger in, install capacity currently. Um, in terms of closing off projects, it we've had. We, well, I, I I meant cl uh, financial close, reaching uh, obtaining money uh, to finance the project. Finance projects. Okay. Um, in terms of getting financial projects, it's been. I, I know some. A lot of the banks find find the small islands a bit risky. They look for large, and we're working with the first Caribbean bank. They have some. They do have some. They do work with the IDB in terms of getting projects, getting funding, which can support both. But can support both grant. We can support the larger scale projects over 100 kilowatts. On the smaller projects below that, there are, and there's generally no finance available within the banking system. Getting private financiers who could come in, who could probably help companies aggregate projects might be a good a good model to, to work with. 
but a lot again because of the size of the projects it's been very difficult some of the local banks have shown interest in project aggregation the challenge for them has always been the cost and the, and the uncertainty of what the regulations will be in the next year or so because a lot of the islands don't have firm regulations Miguel? I'm sorry, I was talking to a, to a mute form. Thank you, very, thank you very much. So uh, we have a few more minutes before we, we wrap up. So I, I, will, I think I would like, what I would like to do is to give the audience the opportunity to, uh, to ask some questions. And I'm going to start with a question for, for Robert. And the, the question is, uh, would FMO look at supporting biomass uh, or MSW gasification projects at the DG level, 250 kilowatts to 1 megawatt level? Uh, this is a company that is focused on off-grid and rural electrification solutions in the Caribbean and the, in Central America. Um. Thanks for that question. Um, I, it's difficult for me to, let's say, to to opine on on this particular project. Uh, maybe the best the best answer is that uh, that we are actually quite focused on off-grid uh, 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 electricity projects. Um, as an example, we've uh, we've invested and financed. Uh, uh, one of the largest uh, uh, off-grid uh, uh, companies uh, providing um, uh, PV solar solutions to um, individual households in uh, in rural areas in Guatemala, um, uh, and we provide them with financing. Uh, had to contribute to energy access to regions where uh, where the grid actually is not. Uh, is not uh, extended to and, and will most likely not be extended to in the, in the short to medium term. Um, so uh, it is something that really is of our interest and uh, uh, I, I would love to, uh, to learn more about that project. Uh, what is important for us is that eventually these projects uh, can become, let's say, uh, at, at the scale that it is uh, uh, also uh, able for us to replicate and to be, let's say, more mainstream business. Many of these um, off-grid uh, off projects or energy access projects are, are quite small. That's, that's also still the case for more the CNI business. Uh, but even though it's small, um, if, if the projects are good, then, uh, then we are always very willing to investigate uh, if and how we, uh, we, we, can, we can finance uh, but then always on, 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 uh, under the assumption that it is replicable and that in the end we can we can get the desired scale. Uh, just to provide a bit of flavor, I mean most most of our tickets are uh, are anywhere between uh, uh, 10 million and 50 million dollars, and the projects are let's say between maybe 40 million and uh, and, uh, and 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 200 million dollars. And these projects um, uh, will certainly not qualify within that range, are much smaller, but also they serve uh, 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 a purpose which is very much uh, in line with our strategy. So, uh, yeah, we, we always take interest to, uh, to, to look into those small projects as well. Thank you, uh, Robert. Uh, another question uh, I have is, uh, are there any developers in the region marketing the renewable energy credits produced by by local projects? Uh, do those any Robert or Jay? Do you know the answer to this? You mean uh, carbon credits? Was that was that the question? Yes. The are they are the developers in the region marketing the carbon energy the carbon credits produced by local projects? Um. I, I believe some are. Uh, we normally do not look at it or take it into account uh, when, when, let's say, uh, looking at the bankability of, of projects. But I know of some projects that still have um, have contracts. Um, they may be a bit uh, uh, old already uh, because that, that, that market, of course, has not been so active um, 
uh, in the last, uh, let's say, uh, eight years. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's not something that we really focus on, but uh, uh, I, I know of a few that, that still have contracts, yeah. In, um, in Robert, uh, go ahead, Jay. I'm just saying I don't, haven't seen any, any projects currently which deal with carbon credit. Thank you. And, um, uh, and maybe this, also, this question is also for, for Robert. Uh, uh, one of the uh, in the audience is asking, what are the more attractive uh, markets uh, in the Caribbean and Central America for uh, bankable PPAs? Do you have any uh, suggestions, Robert, based on what you have seen and based on the criteria that FMO uses to, uh, to look into projects in different markets? Yeah, I think all, um, I mean, all countries, they have their own dynamics, right? And uh, we, we have not, let's say, one very rigid, strict set of requirements. Uh, in, in other words, if there's something, one element missing, maybe in, in, maybe not so much in terms of a PPA or the bare elements of a PPA, but very much so in other elements that may be risky in the, uh, in the framework of a particular country, or, or with, uh, with certain off-takers, then we try to find solutions uh, in the structuring of a, of a transaction. That maybe in some countries where there is more uh, sort of um, backlog in terms of payments from, from off-takers to generators, that, uh, that there's an increased need to build up certain reserves to, uh, to, make, the, uh, to make the lenders comfortable. Uh, we've seen that to some extent, for example, in uh, in uh, in Dominican Republic, uh, but that could also apply to some other countries. Um, uh, yeah, I, mean, I think it's. I mean, I think many people know that also in Honduras there is uh, uh, there is let's say um, um, uh, a, a re reorganization going on of the off taker, and uh, we all hope that it will be solved soon. Um, so that also there uh, the uh, the uh, the situation uh, uh, with 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 backlog payments, if any, can be improved. Um, yeah. So the we've been active in in all countries actually. Uh, we we even so we have quite a portfolio in Nicaragua, in Dominican Republic, in Panama, Costa Rica, Honduras uh, is is actually one of our bigger exposures. Uh, but also El Salvador, we uh, we have recently become very active. Um, uh, Guatemala and 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 even Haiti, uh, Haiti uh, and and Jamaica. Uh, so I, I think the short uh, answer is that we first would always like to uh, to see if we can find a solution uh, that is um, uh, that is mutually agreeable between developer and lenders, and that uh, that builds mm -hmm. on. The Perfect. Thank you, Robert. And just to finish in in five in thirty seconds, uh, what if anything the audience needs to take with them from this uh, 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 event, this this webinar? What would you think is one of the key points that they need to keep present after they leave this uh, webinar? Well, I think it's very important that uh, that we all stay very focused on expanding the uh, the renewable percentage in in the energy matrixes across Central America and and the Caribbean, and that certainly comes with challenges, but uh, it, are, it are good markets, and, uh, and, and we, we for sure will, will remain focusing on it. And uh, I also recommend uh, all listeners to, um, uh, to, to come to, to Recam and to use that as a platform uh, to maybe gain more insight. Thank you very much. Jay, uh, a, a final word from you? Um, I think that's just to verify that, just to mention, just to know it's important that the obviously Central America and the Latin American countries have a very different market to the Eastern Caribbean countries, and that the opportunities within the Eastern Caribbean are probably beyond just the solar and in, and in, and renewables, but they're also larger large opportunities in terms of transportation and mobility, um, IoT and other areas which do help with which do help with the transition and reducing our energy consumption but the markets are very different and the approach to dealing with these markets need to, need to be thought of 
when when entering both these markets separately. Thank you very much. And and I think uh, we, we are running uh, out of time. Uh, we have many many questions that uh, we weren't able to 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 address. Uh, another reason to attend uh, Recam uh, next uh, March, where we will have the opportunity opportunity to, to talk more in details about all the different uh, aspects and points that we have discussed uh, during our conversation today. So uh, so I want to give thanks to everybody for attending, Robert, Jade, and Luz. Thank you very much for organizing this event. And we hope to see you in RECAM in March 2019. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye-bye, Miguel. Bye-bye, Jade. Thanks everyone. Thanks for your thanks, Robert. Thank you to all, um, especially our special thank you to uh, Miguel, Jake, and Robert for for your participation uh, on this webinar. And I'll see you in Panama City in March. Uh, so please register for uh, to be attending to the um, Recan 2019 using the code webinar 10 and you will receive a 10% discount. Thank you very much to all.